Hello everyone, welcome back to Mistress TV, David here. In this video, we answer some of your questions. So let's get to it. Hope you guys are having a great day. Before we start, check the info box down below for free plugins, special discounts and offers. And if you haven't already, please go and check out the new website, mixbustv.com. In there you will find all the mix and mastering courses, start to finish, many different genres. On the website, you can also book all the other services, mixing, mastering, private lesson, mix consultations, and a lot more. And if you wanna access the exclusive videos here on YouTube, click the join button down here, become a Mixbus TV member, and access all the exclusive videos. And if the channel is helping you, please consider using the super thanks, support Mixbus TV, or grab some merch. Let's get to the questions. First one is from Last Doll KGGM. For these plugins that imitate analog equipment it is wise to lower the input signal and then let the plugin work out the gain match through processing and output knob or leave the input as is and gain match it with the output accordingly is there is a difference can this affect nonlinear processing no it's not the same the input level will 100 affect the results the non-linear processes, the linear processes, everything in the plugin. But as for whether or not you should leave the output where it is or lower it or turn it up, it all depends on the level of the source material. If you have, for example, a vocal, a bass that is recorded too low, most likely you will have to push the input of that plugin just you would do with a piece of hardware to hit the sweet spot. At the same time, if you have material that is recorded too hot, you will most likely have to lower the gain. That's why the gain has a negative and a positive side. And if the plugin is coded well and it emulates close enough the hardware, you should hear a big difference and it should be extremely apparent. If you're not, probably the plugin doesn't emulate the hardware that well. But the fact that you adjust the input doesn't mean that the output is irrelevant. It depends on the plugin, or better, it depends on what hardware the plugin is emulating because some hardware have a clean output stage and some piece of hardware have color, probably a different color than the input at the output stage. There are many units that have an input transformer and an output transformer, and those two are usually different. And even if they are the same, they are in different position in the signal path. So whether you drive one versus the other will yield different results. Some piece of hardware have a clean output that just served the purpose of level matching and some others have a colored output. That's why you see people moving hardware like this with both hands. But yes, generally speaking, the level of the material hitting the plugin is extremely important. Whether you take care of it before hitting the plugin with clip gain or the input control of the plugin itself, it is very important. Next one from Eon Slide. Have you ever tried recording your studio monitors as the room sound and adding it back into the mix? I've tried it at home with mixed results, but I'm really curious how it would sound if it's your system. Yes, I did. It has been done countless times by many engineers out there, whether recording engineers or mixing engineers. It is a viable technique, especially if you have samples or sample drums or even virtual instruments. In fact, if you think about it, there are plugins out there like UAD Studio CD or Atlantic Chambers by SoftTube that emulate just that. They emulate what we call chambers in many big studios, Capitol Records, many others. They have a dedicated room, which is either empty or has a few pieces of furniture in it, and usually with a weird shape where they place a speaker or multiple speakers and a microphone or multiple microphones, and then they send vocals or drums or whatever the case might be, play it through the speakers and then re-record it through the microphones. And this is a technique that is as old as I can remember. Now, in those cases, those rooms, those chambers, are meant to be a natural reverb. They have a big enough size, usually tall ceilings, and you can move speakers around, you can change speaker type, you can change microphones. Now, the problem in doing this at home is that many people have very tiny, small rooms, and usually they are extremely dead. A mixing room, it's not really a room where you want to do this process in, because mixing rooms are generally kind of dead. You want to do it in a live room, you know, in a recording room. Like, for example, at my new studio, we have a giant live room. We really tall slanted ceilings. That's perfect for it. 
but a mixing room, yeah, you're gonna have mixed result and it's gonna be a hit or miss. The best you can hope for is for the material, it, if it was stale, if it was too mechanic, to get it back and be a little more lively, whether you use the recording itself or you blend it with the original track, in which case you need to pay attention to phase but that's how it's gonna be. If you have any questions for the Q&A, leave it in the comments down below, by the way. Next one, J. Williams 6976 When mixing, do you use delay before reverb or reverb before delay? Also, should all vocals, bass, kick drum, I guess, and snare be mono? Since I'm here, what percentage pan do you use for ad-libs? I know it may vary, but sort of a bass line. All right, we have a lot of uh, questions here. Delay before or after reverb, either or. In my mixes, there's gonna be probably 50-50. 50% you're gonna see a reverb before the delay and 50% you're gonna see the opposite. Should all vocals, bass, kick drum and snare be mono? Okay, let me elaborate a little bit on this one. Yes and no, meaning those elements are the usually the driving elements of a song, right? And the mono channel is where the power and the impact of a song is. The sides is where the width and the ear candies and the spaciousness of a track is, but the impact is in the center. So we definitely want to have the main elements, right? The driving rhythmic section. So kick, snare, bass, strong and present in the mono channel. We want the lead vocal in the mono channel as well. That doesn't mean though that they should be only mono and that these elements shouldn't have any information on the sides. Actually, this is kind of a pet peeve of mine because nowadays most hip hop mixes, trap hip hop mixes, they have dead center, mono, kick, snare, bass, and uh, many times vocals, except for a few throw effects, which usually results in very narrow, very kind of stale and boring mixes. Especially vocals, I want to say in probably all genres have a lot of stereo information, doubles, ad-libs, quadruples, stacks, background vocals. There is a ton of layers for vocals that goes into the sides. Of course, the point here is you don't want not to have the lead vocal in the center because God forbid something happens to your mix and it's not being listened to in the perfect environment. Maybe, you know, one speaker is here, one speaker is there, one speaker is broken, it gets played into a mono thing, like a mono speaker or something like that. You don't want your mix to completely lose the balance. And these are the main elements. So if you're losing the kick, it's gonna sound horrible. Snare, same thing, lead vocals, bass, right? These are all elements that need to be clear and present in your mix no matter where is played and no matter how much your mix is abused when it goes out. That's one of the reasons because people need the best mix possible because your mix will be abused out there. It's kind of a stupid argument when people say, oh, why do you need a professional mix when your mix is gonna be played on MP3 and earbuds or you know little tiny speakers or laptop or phones? That's exactly why you need the best mix possible because your mix is gonna be abused out there like nothing else. And nowadays, more than any other time because we have so many media and so many different medias where people listen to your mix. So people need a professional mix to make sure even more that it translates as good as it can in as many media as possible. So to summarize, you most definitely need those elements to be present in a mix, but that doesn't mean that they don't have stereo information. I have many videos on monocompatibility, when you should obsess about it, when you shouldn't obsess about it, what elements can be lost uh, when a mix is mono and what elements cannot be lost when a mix is summed to mono, but I will just say that and then I'll put the links probably to those videos in the info box down below. A stereo mix will never be 100% mono compatible and that is completely normal because a mix that is 100% mono compatible is a mono mix. So unless you want a mono mix, you need to understand what can be, so to speak, lost either completely or partially when mono and it doesn't matter and what can't. And the last question was what percentage pen do you use for ad libs? I mix LCR. So everything in a mix for me is either hard left, hard right or center with the exceptions of prop a few things like toms or few elements that it would be, you know, pretty stupid and dated to put like 100% 
hard left right but you can probably count those elements in two hands but that doesn't mean that i don't move my pans left and right and and have elements moving in the stereo field next one is one of our members thank to all the members supporting the channel harry mark 22 how do distortion saturation clipping and limiting relate to each other how do tape tube and drive fit in when would you use what and in what combination would you place them in what order of course there's not an answer to this there's no order there's no secret formula we've said it many times everything can be put before or after everything the key to understand when how how much and why it's simple in one hand and very complicated in another you need to understand and master each and every tool and really understand what they do that it's done by sitting with each tool and experiment with them for hours and days and weeks and months and years on end and then you at that point digest and master and really understand what each of these tools does to the material to a wide variety of material and then at that point you start experimenting by putting one before the other and understanding the combinations i can't nobody can tell you any order that's why there's no substitute for experience and that's why mixing takes time how do distortion saturation clipping and limited relate to each other distortion and saturation are the same thing they are simply two words to describe the same exact thing the difference is usually just semantic between these two with saturation usually we mean something subtle and with distortion we usually mean a guitar amp you know, turn to 11 but they are basically the same thing it's just levels of it saturation can turn into distortion when it's overblown and when it's too much as for clipping and limiting these two i have a video on the difference between clippers and limiters uh, you can search it on the channel but in short the limiters have one function and one function only to avoid any signal to go past a certain threshold by chopping it off and brick wall limiters are designed to do this in the most transparent way unfortunately that's not possible <laughs> and while there are crazy good limiters out there and some of them are extremely transparent like for example a smart limit from sonnyball is one of the most transparent limiting does have artifacts it's just a byproduct that as for right now where the technology is now and probably that will never change has side effects and artifacts usually you will find that limiting will dual transients will squash things you will lose focus you will lose clarity if you push it too much clipping instead is a form of saturation which has as a byproduct of it controlling the nominal level so the limiter purpose the limiters are designed to do that the clippers were designed to saturate the signal and as a byproduct of the saturation they shave off the trends and they kind of bend the trends and as opposed to chop it off like the limiter and on especially on transient material you will find that some clippers again it depends on the type of the clipper it depends on the material will be able to contain and limit and diminish the nominal level while at the same time enhancing the transient which is opposite to the limiter but it does it by introducing distortion saturation color three words for the same thing we like that because when the audio events is short a kick a snare we can't really perceive the distortion or or better we can't perceive the bad distortion the bad sound so to speak it just adds harmonics and if it's a short audio event it enhances the perceived loudness of it some of my most popular videos explain this concept and those are the videos that everybody else copied then at the same time for the same reason you have to pay attention to long audio events like a bass and 808 when you clip too much and you saturate too much they start to be crunchy and in some cases you know it became a style the super distorted 808 and everything but let's not talk about it how to relate with each other again experience will tell you what combination will work for a given track there's not obviously a formula 
Sometimes you're going to use two limiters. Sometimes you're going to use two clippers and a limiter. Sometimes you're going to use a sandwich of clipper, limiting, clipping, limiting again. It can't be predicted, not by me, not by anybody else. So I would highly advise that you guys stay away from people that give you formulas because they're just either talking out of their ass and they generally don't know and they think that their way to do things it's the best way or maybe they found something that works on their music and their music alone they're not mixing or mastering for others and they just give that to other people as the best way it's not in a malicious way they just don't know better or they just usually want your money because they claim to have found the formula that you can buy for xxx amount of dollars next one from instagram gta freshy fresh hey dave i was wondering if you could share your two bus and how you use it and if it differentiates from mix to mix. Thanks. Yes, uh, first of all, it differentiates from mix to mix, absolutely. That's one of the reasons because I have so much hardware. It's because there's not one chain that works for everything, same as there's not one compressor that works for everything or one EQ or one saturator. But on the two bus, I have a handful of pieces that they are there, let's say, 80% of the time. So as for right now, my two bus chain in the order that is the starting point, because the order can change also, because as you guys might know, I have the flock audio, which allows me to change the routing on my entire chain, mix and mastering any piece of gear. I can put it whatever I want with just a click. So the first unit is the Neve 542s, the tape emulators. Then I have the black box HG2. Then I have the Fusion and in the insert of the Fusion, I have the SPL PQ. I have usually another color EQ, for example, either a mag or the Empress. And then I have one of these three compressors, NG Bus by West Audio. That has been probably on eight out of 10 mixes, at least until the past two years when I got the other two that now take its place more often, Stamp Child 660 or Bus Plus. SSL. And since I got these two in, it's pretty much a 33% which one I'm going to use on the two bus. Of course, when the 670 is the ticket, the other two are completely out of the question because it's a completely different style. When the SSL style is required, it can be one or the other depending on the song. And also depending if I'm not using the SSL bus plus on drums because I really like it on drums. And after the compressor, I go into the Matthew Lane spacecraft on the moon. And then I capture everything with my mastering converter, which sometimes I clip, sometimes I don't. And the reason because some of the machines are in insert in the fusion, this is good to point out, is because the insert of the fusion allows me to turn everything that is in the insert chain into mid side. So if I want the SPL PQ, which is a stereo dual mono EQ in mid side, I can do it. The Mag EQ can be used in mid-side, the Empress can be used in mid-side, and so on. Oh, I forgot, and sometimes I run the Symphi EQ before the converter just for the filters top and bottom. And that's it for this Q&A. I hope you guys liked it. If you did, please don't forget to leave a like, comment down below if you have questions, the best will be answered in the next Q&A videos. Also stay tuned because there's gonna be a really cool recap of NAM 2024. So many cool things this year that I'm gonna show you. If you haven't already, go check out the new website mixwestv.com. In there you will find all the mix and mastering courses available and you can book all the other services. Click the join button, become a Mixwest TV member if you wanna access the exclusive videos here on YouTube. Consider using the super thanks if the channel is helping you. Thank you for watching, subscribe if you haven't already. Stay safe, see you next time.